What makes psychology a science? It is the scientific method that essentially defines a science. Psychology does not rely on superstition or magical beliefs. It is a science. And what makes it a science is, as I said earlier, the scientific method. We use scientific method to study human behavior and human mental processes. There are two ways of conducting scientific research. One uses the quantitative method and the other is the qualitative method of research. In the quantitative method, we transform psychological phenomena to numbers so that we can measure them easily. I'll give you an example. If I want to research anger, I will ask you, how angry do you feel on a scale of 1 to 10? And you can say, if you're not feeling too angry, you can say, I'm feeling my anger at four. And if you're feeling very, very angry, you can say, I'm feeling nine. So this way, what we do is we transform naturally occurring psychological phenomena to some kind of numbers so that we can measure them. And then we subject these same phenomena to mathematical processes. So for instance, I can ask a hundred people how angry they are feeling at any event. And then I average their scores to say, people are feeling moderately angry or extremely angry in response to some event. And I will not only be able to produce an average, but also a variation saying, for instance, that people's anger was in the range of 2 to 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. And the average was 5. So this way, I am able to express psychological phenomena numerically. This approach has been developed to a very sophisticated level. The example that I gave you is a very basic, simple, rudimentary one so that you can understand what I'm saying. But as I said, psychological assessment has become a very, very highly specialized field where we have tests that measure the extent of people's depression. For example, Beck's depression inventory is a set of questions that we ask people about how depressed they are. And it produces a fairly accurate representation of their mental state. We also have Beck anxiety inventory, which does the same for anxiety and so on. So the purpose of sharing this knowledge with you is that you understand that the quantitative method is one that has been used predominantly in psychology. But more recently, the qualitative method is also being used. And what is the qualitative method? The qualitative research method argues that quantifying psychological phenomena or turning them into numbers does an injustice to the reality of these phenomena. So for instance, to say that you're feeling angry at four on a scale of one to 10 does not accurately capture your anger. And they would also argue that when you average two people's anger scores, you're ignoring how these two people treat numbers. I'll give you an example. In my class, I was asking students how angry they're feeling at the moment. So one student said three and another said seven. When I asked them for what it means to them, it seemed like the person who was rating their anger at three was actually a lot angrier than the other person who was rating their anger at seven. So all of us may be very similar in that we understand numbers and that we understand anger, but we may be very different on how we rate things. It's just like an examiner giving 60 marks for a very good answer, as opposed to another examiner giving 90 marks for a very good answer. And that kind of consistency cannot be ensured in subjective evaluations. So therefore, the objection by the qualitative researcher is that what we measure when we're measuring these phenomena 
is something else, something totally different from what we say we're trying to measure. Another objection to the quantitative method is whatever we find in the laboratory setting may not hold in the real life. So for example, many psychology experiments are conducted in the laboratory. So we find that there is a whole range of phenomena that are only experienced in the laboratory. For instance, experiments on backward masking where you flash stimuli for less than 16 milliseconds and our reaction time to these phenomena, to these stimuli can be measured on a computer screen. The only problem with that is no such phenomena exist in the outside world. So the relevance of laboratory experimentation has also been questioned by qualitative researchers. So what do qualitative researchers do? Qualitative researchers go to people, they observe them or they interview them. They observe people in their natural environment. They study people in their real life settings. But there are criticisms to that approach also. In one study, when psychologists went into an organization to study people's behavior, what they found was that people improved their performance when they were being observed. Now, there's the paradox. If I'm going to observe somebody in their real life natural setting, they're going to improve their performance because they know they're being watched. And if they're going to improve their performance, how am I going to know how they perform when I'm not there? So that's the paradox that's created by what we call the Hawthorne effect. And in the Hawthorne effect, people tend to perform better when they're being observed. There are other problems with qualitative research. The researcher's findings are purely subjective. Whatever the researcher observes, they observe with their own eyes and their own minds. And so a lot of their findings are considered purely subjective and perhaps even biased. So no matter what method we use, whether we use quantitative method or qualitative method, whether we study people in the laboratory or in real life, there are trade-offs to each method. At the same time, I believe we need to use a bit of both. We need to use qualitative methods to find ecologically valid, rich data. And we need quantitative measures to find scientifically valid objective data. And it is the blend of both that will lead us to any significant conclusions about human behavior.